Nu må det til bedre en af spændende sang, det er Amen. So we have here uh, today the feast of Saint Peter of Alcantara. Um, I mentioned him last uh, last week. Uh, he was um, uh, one of the spiritual directors or advisors to Teresa of Avila, from whom she learned um, much of, of what she did about prayer, and which she wrote about in her books. So that's always the way it is in the church. If we have anybody to, you know, thank for something, it's not just one person. It's usually, it's many more people that were involved in, in giving us what we have. Uh, because the author, of course, is God, right? Why did, why did Teresa... Uh, um, Uh, Avila ran into uh, Peter Alcantara because God wanted it to happen. He, she needed to know stuff so she could write it down. And here we go. We're going to hear about him. Um, he had a, 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 a pretty um, uh, incredible life. He ended up being this, this incredible desert mystic, um, very much like the early desert fathers. And um, again, one of those saints who, as a child, just had a natural uh, inclination towards this. Uh, he was born to noble parents in Alcantara, Spain in 1499, and his father was a governor. He was very pious, sometimes so deep in prayer that servants would not be able to get a response from him. Uh, he received an excellent education, and by the age of 16, had graduated from the University of Salamanca. So, I mean, imagine this, a young nobleman, 1500s, your father's governor, you've got servants, Um, and yet he was so given to prayer. Now contrast that childhood, right, with, with what we hear he's going to end up doing in the Franciscans, which is, which is what he joined, right? He grew up in this, this life of, of ease and comfort, completely didn't affect him. Uh, so what did he do at 16? University of Salamanca graduate, very um, uh, capable, very advanced. He joins the Franciscans immediately at 16 years of old. Uh, 16 years old. Uh, and then after eight years, at 22, he was sent to found a new community in a nearby city. And uh, three years after that, he was ordained a priest. And um, he was very harsh with himself, with physical penances. He would wear um, an iron, uh, a belt with iron studs uh, turned on the inside. So they would, they would, they'd poke him constantly. Uh, he frequently used the discipline. And he suffered from uh, a greater than usual sleepiness. He found himself always sleepy and just needing a, a tremendous amount of sleep. So he resolved to make that his particular penance. And he so overcame his sleepiness that he ended up um, uh, 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 eventually only needing 90 minutes of sleep every evening. The rest of the time he would spend in prayer. So it's... That's, that's not usual, right? Don't try that, right? Don't, don't try this at home. Don't, don't try this. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it, it's, these saints are uh, very unusual for those abilities. Uh, so uh, for the next 14 years, he lives an exemplary life as a Franciscan, right? Doing these penances and, and so on. And during this time, he became a very effective preacher, especially to the poor. And he says that he enjoyed preaching to the poor more than any other group. Why is that? Because they listened. They responded. They had nothing left to lose. And so when he preached about giving all for Christ, they could do it. Because what little they had, they, they would give away. And he, he saw the effect it had on them. So he very much enjoyed uh, uh, preaching to the poor and see, seeing that, that faith and devotion from them. Um, eventually, uh, by the time he was 40 years old, he would be elected superior general of the province of the Franciscans. And he immediately began to set about writing a reformed rule. Uh, the Franciscans, of, of, as we know, were founded by, by St. Francis to be um, living in ab, uh, a radical poverty, not owning anything, not knowing from one day to the next if they were going to even be eating and so on. So that was the original intent of the founder. But of course, as usual, by, you know, 300 years later, very lax. Uh, so Peter Van Cantara starts to write some reforms for the entire province. Um, he met with such resistance, however, that he, um, despite the fact that he was elected to the position, he ended up resigning because the people were just not, not cooperating with his, um, with his desires. Um, and that kind of gives an indication. I, many people will elect somebody to a position and then be very unhappy with what they do because they're actually serious, right? they're sincere. So he actually, he not only resigns as superior, he actually leaves the Franciscans. 
And this would be difficult because he had been a Franciscan since he was 16 years old and now he's in his 40s. That was the only uh, organization he'd ever known, the only religious organization. So he had to leave that and withdrew into a deserted place in the mountains uh, in Spain. And there he began to live as a hermit in the strict observance of poverty as um, uh, St. Francis would have wished. That was his idea. So uh, he didn't live as a hermit very long because he was soon joined by other holy men uh, who also wanted to imitate that way of living. And soon a small community formed and then another community and so on. And um, after um, 15 years, he had met with such success uh, that uh, he actually traveled to Rome to obtain permission for the rule of life, uh, which he had previously drawn up for the Franciscans. His kind of, his reform for the Franciscans, he goes to Rome and asks, can I found these, these foundations after this rule? And um, he leaves for Rome, or sorry, he, yeah, he leaves Spain uh, to Rome and he journeys barefoot the entire way. And his constitutions were approved. And on his way back uh, from Rome, uh, he doesn't wait, he begins founding monasteries. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, Teresa of Avila would form the, the um, Order of Carmelites uh, Discalced, the, the Discalced Carmelites. Um, she would re reform that order. And many other times you have reforms of orders that become their own thing. But this is, this is uh, uh, rather interesting in that um, Peter of Alcantara did, I don't know what they call that, like an end run around the Franciscans. He, he was elected superior general of the Franciscans. He couldn't get his reforms accepted by the Franciscans. So then he goes to Rome and they approve the constitutions and then he begins founding Franciscan communities, reformed communities. And what happens is um, the, the entire Franciscan province ends up absorbing those Franciscan communities and then they begin to leaven, like, like leaven, they, have, they start to affect the rest. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what an example, I would say that's a tremendous example of perseverance because he didn't know that. He didn't know that, you know, when he left the Franciscans, I mean, that was it. As far as he knew, he went into the mountains, he was going to live there the rest of his life. Fifteen years later, he ends up reforming the Franciscans after all. How about that, right? Wasn't what anybody expected, I'm sure, but that's how God works. And that's what God does with perseverance. We just never know what might happen. Um, so let's see. Mm -hmm. Oh, so uh, this is also interesting. Uh, he was a contemporary with St. Francis Borgia, uh, who also, you know, he was a nobleman who, um, who, who was a consort uh, uh, to the king, an advisor, and so on, and, and himself resigned from, from that life of, of high nobility to become a priest and superior general of the Jesuits, uh, certainly dealing himself with the need for reform. And so Francis Borgia, on seeing the success of Peter of Alcantara with the Franciscans, writes to him and congratulates him on his efforts, saying, your remarkable success is a special comfort to me. Um, and again, so, so this is, Peter of Alcantara was, was even though he was a hermit, um, very well known because of his efforts, because of his abilities. And in fact, I would say the more capacity somebody has uh, when they withdraw, just the little bit that they do, people notice because they see, they see that. They see that ability. They see that talent. They see that, that this person gave up so much to become isolated that, that what they do affects those around them. And so it affected St. Francis Borgia and also Teresa of Avila, as I've mentioned. And in fact, um, let's see. From all his time in solitude, uh, Peter had learned about mystical prayer, and he wrote a little book. It's called A Treatise on Prayer and Meditation. And this was considered a masterpiece by the Venerable Louis of Granada, who wrote The Sinner's Guide. Also, Teresa of Avila, as I mentioned, and also Francis de Sales, right? All of these, these important uh, uh, writers would consider Peter of Alcantara's book, um, you, know, uh, you know, seminal, right, for, for their work. Um, now, much of what we know, the, the reason we know all this about T Peter of Alcantara, uh, much of it we learned from St. Teresa of Avila, is he met with her towards the end of his life, and just as he had been an inspiration to St. Francis Borgia, so he was an inspiration and a support to Teresa of Avila in reforming the Carmelites. Uh, he knew her, the difficulties th that she faced, but he had conquered them, right? He, he, had, he had successfully reformed the Franciscans, so he helped her uh, uh, in reforming the Carmelites. 
Uh, so she would, um, in fact, when you read her works, she writes about, she'll say like, I know a very holy person who has reached like the, the seventh mansion of prayer, etc. And she's talking about, alternately, she'll talk about Francis Borgia or Peter Valcantara is who she, she writes about in her books. She doesn't call them by name, but that's, that's who she was talking about. Uh, now, uh, 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 and um, so he, would, he would tell her some of the penances that he would do and some of the, the, the things he would do in the mountains. And um, from the, this is from the breviary account we have today. Um, it says that he brought his body into bondage by unceasing watching, fasting, scourging, cold, and all manner of hardships, having made it uh, a promise never to allow himself any rest in this world. Uh, the love of God and of his neighbor uh, often burned so hot within his breast that he ran from his cell into the open air to cool himself. Uh, he became wrapped in meditation uh, that frequently he neither ate nor drank for the space of several days. He was oftentimes seen to levitate, shining with a heavenly glow. He would walk across torrential streams, uh, multiplied, would multiply food for his brethren in need, and a staff which he fixed in the earth grew into a fig tree. <clears throat> uh, once while he was traveling by night in the midst of a heavy snowstorm, he took refuge in a ruined house that which the roof had completely collapsed and the falling snow that, that he might not be um, uh, uh, smothered, the falling snow made a roof over the house in which he was staying. Uh, so again, and I mentioned also that he'd slept only 90 minutes to two hours each night, and this he did in a sitting position. Um, in fact, and for this reason, for that reason, he's known as a patron saint of night watchmen and those who keep vigil at Eucharistic adoration. Uh, so Teresa of Avila also says that he had the gift of prophecy and of discerning the spirits. So, um, you know, and, and lest we think, right, um, too often we think of the saints as, the, as these heroes of um, uh, willpower. I'm going to will myself to become a saint. I'm going to, um, uh, against all inclinations to the contrary, force myself to stay awake, to do penance, to do all these things. Um, if you try to do that, you're going to end up a wreck. You're going to be a, a nervous, you have a nervous breakdown. Uh, what, what the saints were able to do this is because, number one, they did it a little bit at a time. Remember, he, he, from the time he was 16, he was a Franciscan doing these things. Um, they took it in the proper order, but also they, they didn't undertake these penances out of, um, you know, guilt or a sense of duty. It was love, right? And I would say I, the key, the key that I mentioned, the love of God often burned so hot within him, he'd have to run out to cool himself in the air. That's how he was able to do it. It was the love of God burning within him. Uh, and that's not something that we can produce by willpower. What we can produce by willpower is a desire to be obedient to God and a desire to do what's right in front of us. What am I supposed to do? I'm going to do that. That's what we do, and I will do it, and I will do it better because I love God. That's how you make the love of God grow. That's what God rewards with more and more until finally you don't have to force yourself to do penance. You want to do penance, right? It's, it's your desire to do these things because the love of God is, is so hot within us. That's what we need to be uh, convinced of. So after uh, 63 years of, of, of good example, on 18 October, uh, uh, Peter of Alcantara did pass into the next world. And in fact, he foretold the day on which he would die. And that was yesterday. The Feast of St. Luke is Peter of Alcantara died on that day. So that's why we have his feast this day. Uh, so he died even as he lived in extreme asceticism. He had a terrible thirst in his last hours, but he refused any water, saying that even our Lord thirsted on the cross right in his last hours. Uh, he was comforted uh, by, uh, in his last hours by a vision of the saints surrounding his bed. Teresa of Avila testifies that at the moment he died, she was, you know, hundreds of miles away. She had a vision of his soul flying to heaven. And a short time later, uh, she had a, a vision of him again. And he said to her, oh, what happy penances to have won for me such glory. Uh, so thus the life and death of Peter of Alcantara. Um, so, uh, we can't imitate those incredible penances uh, of his, uh, but we can imitate his perseverance and his docility to the will of God. 
right? He never gave up, and he went wherever God indicated. And by his perseverance, he reformed the Franciscans. He inspired the uh, Francis Borgia of the Jesuits, uh, and he inspired Teresa of uh, Avila to reform the um, um, uh, Carmelites. So, right, three different orders benefited from one man, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, and the Carmelites. What an influential figure, right? What an amazing uh, uh, um, uh, difference to the church. And, and it was because of his docility. He just did what God indicated him to do. He spent time in prayer. He was a Franciscan. He was a priest. He, was, he founded the new order. He just went where he was supposed to go, did what he was supposed to do, and he did it with that pure love of God. So we, we might not be able to do all these penances, right, but we can imitate uh, that docility. Accept what comes to us. It's from the hand of God. Uh, uh, not to get upset or irritated or to try to force something in the spiritual life. Just let it happen. Let God do his thing. We be faithful in little things. And, and, and if God calls us the greater, uh, then blessed be God. We're ready. Uh, so St. Peter of Alcantara, pray for us. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.